They paved paradise and put up a parking lot with a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hot spot. But don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. And they put them in a tree museum And then they charge the people A dollar and a half just to see them Oh no, no, don't it always seem to go That you don't know what you got till it's gone They pay paradise, they put up a parking lot Give me some spots on my apples, but leave me the birds and the bees. Please, now don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone. They pay paradise, put up a parking lot. Hey, now they pay paradise to put up a parking lot. Ooh, bop, bop. Late last night, I heard the screen door slam And a big yellow taxi took away my best friend Oh no, don't it always seem to go That you don't know what you got till it's gone They paid paradise, they put up a parking lot Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone. They paid paradise, they put up a parking lot. Oh no, they paid paradise, put up a parking lot. Yeah, yeah, they paid paradise and put up a parking lot. friends, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship at Stony Brook. My name is Jessica Pond, and it is my pleasure to be serving as your worship associate this morning. Our service leader today is Tom Pelletier. In addition to being a member of UUFSB, Tom is chair of the board of SEED, the Center for Environmental Education and Discovery, and he's asked Eric Powers, one of SEED's co-founders, and Sally Wellinger, SEED's Executive Director, to join him today. Our Director of Religious Education is Deb Little. For information about our in-person religious education class schedule and how to contact Deb and our amazing religious education volunteers, please see our website at uufsb.org. I want to extend a special welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time this morning. We are so glad you're here. We are a welcoming congregation to people of all ages and identities who are seeking a spiritual home. Unitarian Universalism is an aspirational faith with no fixed creed we all must adhere to to belong. Instead, we are united by our principles and sources of inspiration, which you can find more information about on our website or on our denominational website, uua.org. Our services vary from week to week, so we hope you will join us multiple times to get a true sense of who we are as a community of faith. Please watch the chat for a few important links during our service, especially the visitors form and the feedback form. We would love to hear from you. Everyone is invited to remain after the service for some meet and greet time. 
and after that, you can leave this gathering and find the link for small group chats in the newsfeed or on our website for more conversation in smaller groups. I have two brief announcements before we begin our service. First, we are very happy to announce that we will be returning to multi-platform services next Sunday, March 6th. We will be reviewing the safety protocols regularly based on the current risk level and posting them on our website, uufsb.org, so be sure to check that before you come in person. If you want to watch the service online, the website will also have the link for that. We are so excited to see you all in the sanctuary again. Second, General Assembly is coming up. The General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association is an annual event where members from congregations all over the U.S. and beyond meet for worship, workshops, and witness, and most importantly, voting on major issues and deciding what the focus and agenda of our denomination as a whole will be for the coming year and beyond. UUFSB, based on our active membership size, is entitled to send five voting delegates and two alternates. This year, GA takes place from June 24th to June 28th, and anyone can attend either in person in Portland, Oregon, or online. Starting this year, it is possible for dele delegates to attend online without any cost. If you are interested in serving as a delegate for the coming year, or if you want further information, Please submit your name to our Denomination Affairs Representative, Laura Lesh, before April 1st. Her email address and cell phone number are in the newsletter and in our directory. Let us enter into the sacred space of worship with the sounding of the morning bell. If you have a chalice or candle, please light it as I light my chalice and read the poem Osprey by Barry Middleton. Morning sky, bright sun, fish eagle of the marsh flying low. Its catch, silver prey, hangs from talon strength. Sepia and bay, white-bellied, bandit-masked, dappled mosaic beneath wings, an intimation that worship needs only the sky. Good morning. Once again, human beings, as well as other living beings and democracy, are all under physical attack, this time in Ukraine. We hope that saner heads prevail soon, and we affirm our solidarity with and send prayers of peace to the people of Ukraine and to the many people in Russia who are opposed to what their government is doing in their name. These words are from the preface, the following words are from the preface of a nature journal by Dennis Polston. Long Island is so much more than shopping malls, concrete highways, and crowded towns and beaches. There are still, still cool wet woodlands, quiet rivers, salt marshes, overgrown meadows, and rolling sand dunes to be enjoyed by those who have eyes to seek and the desire to learn about the other Long Island, the one that existed long before the first settlers broke ground. Please join in singing Hymn 203, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky, offered to us by Maureen Shaman and Bethany Riddle. Swift 
rushing wind so wild and strong, white clouds that sail in heaven alone. Cool flowing water, pure and clear, make music for all life to hear. Alleluia, alleluia, dance for even fire so strong and bright, and bless us with your warmth and light. Alleluia, alleluia. So, Osprey, Pandion Haliatus. It shares a name with our bald eagle, Haliatus leucocephalus, the Latin meaning sea eagle uh, for Haliatus. Uh, Pandion was a Greek king in Athens. So I believe its Latin name really is supposed to mean the king of the sea eagles, truly a master hunter. Uh, just look at this image as it transforms its body shape from an agile airplane diving towards the water into a torpedo armed with talons. Its head resting on its shins keeps an exacting eye on its intended target as it, and is able to make any last second adjustments in case the fish tries any evasive maneuvers. Once the fish is locked into those talons, the osprey must get airborne once again before its feathers get waterlogged. Watch this short video showing the real life struggle with each meal they catch. After hitting the water and grabbing the fish, the game still isn't over for the osprey and its quarry. He needs to get airborne again. His talons are equipped with adhesive scales and long curved claws for an unbreakable hold. But a big trout can match him weight for weight, and the instinct of the fish is to swim down. There are tales of weak and hungry ospreys being dragged to the bottom, unable to release the fish or lift off from the water successfully. But osprey wings are adapted to give maximum lift from the water. And this male is young and strong. This is a struggle he's destined to win. But from the fish's perspective, it's a different story.
you'll notice the osprey sometimes fully submerges in pursuit of its prey. They're the only raptor I know of that can close their nostrils, even though there's many other species of raptor that hunt fish. They also have special scales and rough foot pads to help them grasp those oh so slippery fish. Their wings are shaped to balance a variety of uses, soaring, lift off from the water surface, as well as long distance flight. That wingspan is about six feet across. Uh, once their young have fledged, most of our East Coast Osprey take off on long vacations in South America. The birds travel as much as 5,000 miles from the Amazon basin across the Caribbean uh, Sea and up the Atlantic coast before they end up at their breeding site here even. An incredible winged migration that normally takes two to three weeks each way. Um, I reached out to a local photographer, Suzanne uh, Belochi, asking her for any um, osprey photos that she'd like to share with you all. And here's what she said about the images she sent. Uh, these are from the Polston's platform. Oh my goodness, uh, he was awesome. And my high school teacher was Art Cooley. So even though these people mentioned have passed away, many local residents conjure up their names when they speak about Osprey. I don't expect anyone here to recognize these names, but I'll let Tom tell you all about them. So I would like to leave you with the call of the Osprey to carry these names and the names of many others who are champions of nature, who have helped save the King of the Eagles. Thank you. One of the uh, interesting things about the building where seed is located is that you can often see osprey uh, circling overhead because uh, it's not far from the ocean. So that's kind of cool. To move into our time of meditation, I just have a few words. I've always had a hard time really stilling my mind for true meditation, but what works for me in times when I'm most unsettled is a slight variation. I find a natural setting and I do deep breathing and listening. My favorite places are forests and beaches. I'm sure most, if not all of us, are indoors this morning, but wherever you are, close your eyes and practice deep breathing. And imagine you're outdoors. Focus on just listening. At first, you might hear nothing. Then maybe you'll hear a bird, maybe the wind. If you're patient, you'll start to hear more. One bird answers another. The wind moves and accelerates and then slows again. Depending on where you are, you might hear rustling in the leaves or the waves breaking. Just listen and let your heart be comforted by the sounds of the earth. After our moment of silence, Peter Winkler and Dee Dee Cook will play hymn number 83, Winds Be Still.
is our spiritual practice of generosity to take a collection during each service, which is shared with a local organization working for social justice. Our Share the Plate recipient for this month is Erase Racism. Erase Racism is an amazing, amazing regional organization that leads public policy campaigns to promote racial equity in housing, public school education, and community development. Their work includes an inclusive housing program, which promotes research, community organizing, and legal action to ensure that all Long Islanders have access to the neighborhood of their choice. Their education and equity initiative works to increase opportunities for Black and Latino students to learn about educational opportunities and advocates for racially diverse schools. They also monitor and advocate for civil rights legislation. We all receive many benefits from our fellowship, as do our communities from our social justice partners, and so we all should contribute as much as we can. The need is great and every contribution makes a difference. All donations are accepted with deep gratitude. You can mail a check or click in the link posted in the chat which will take you to the donate button on our website. Thank you. If you look to the daily news so that you can stay attuned to what matters, you might find the headlines don't describe the beauty of the world. So if you hang your head straight out of bed because you read the doom and gloom and got discouraged, ignore your computer screen and look to see the beauty of the world. Beauty like the sun coming down, beauty like the seed in the ground, rising and reaching out reaching for the sky beauty like life in the land moving in your own two hands beauty like the wondrous chance to be alive and if you're down to your final dime but can't decide what else to buy to be happy you don't need a credit card to give your heart the beauty of the world if you walk the street with tired feet, bending underneath the grief that you carry, lay the weight you brought along down upon the beauty of the world. Beauty like the wind in the trees, beauty like children's dreams, beauty like the sun above an osprey's wings. Beauty like ties that bind us, Beauty like acts of kindness, beauty like the light inside of everything. Beauty like the sun coming down, beauty like a seed in the ground. Rising and reaching out, reaching for the sky. Beauty like life in the land, moving in your own two hands. Beauty like the wondrous chance to be alive. To be alive, to be alive. If your whole shtick is tragic hip, but you are sick of being such a big cynic, you can try out a joyful shout and sing about the beauty of the world. And if you don't like to have to wait and think your chances aren't great to get to heaven, maybe one way to save your soul is get to know the beauty of the world. Get to know the beauty of the world. Get to know the beauty of the world.
By mid-March, the first osprey have arrived. And within the following few weeks, they begin to repair their huge stick nests. That we are now seeing these magnificent birds along our shorelines is remarkable. In the 50s and 60s, their populations declined so rapidly that many biologists predicted they would disappear from the Northeastern United States within 20 years. In the 40s, there were about 300 active nests on Gardner's Island. But by 1965, there were less than 20 and only three chicks could be found. The culprit was DDT, a pesticide commonly used on Long Island to control mosquitoes. That quote is from Dennis Poulston's beautifully illustrated book, A Nature Journal, published in 1992. His descriptions of how we avoided disaster for Osprey humbly omits his own part in that story, but it's a major one. And it's a story that should be a point of pride for people of Brookhaven and Long Island for a couple of reasons. First, because it was the first time in this country and possibly the world that citizens sued to halt ecological damage and won. But also, and more to my point today, the story of Long Island's osprey is one that shows how one person's connection to nature and determination to fight for wildlife can change the world. Dennis Poulston's personal story is one of a lifetime of adventure in the natural world. He was born on the coast of England and spent his childhood falling in love with the ocean. He gained university degrees in both biology and naval architecture. And in his 20s, he set sail with a friend on a six-year trip around the world in a 31-foot boat. I, he wrote a book about those years called The Blue Water Vagabond, and I wish I had time to detail some of the crazy things he lived through. But by 1939, he had ma married a Long Island native, Be Betty Wellington, and settled here. He soon grew to love this land that is so closely connected to the ocean. Working as a naval architect during World War II, he helped to design the amphibious troop landing boat that played a key role in the Allied victory in Europe and the Pacific. Peelston spent most of the Pacific theater training and leading troops in the use of the so-called duck boats. He was later awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Truman for his role in the war. When Poulston returned to Long Island, he settled in Brookhaven and worked as technical and public information officer at Brookhaven National Laboratories and until his retirement in 1970. During those decades, he'd also been asked to study the osprey of Long Island, specifically the population nesting on Gardner's Island, a privately owned island between the forks of Long Island. Poulston documented a precipitous drop in osprey population on this sparsely inhabited island. In 1948, there were 300 nests and the typical two chicks per nest. Only eight years later, there were only 200 nests and an average of only one chick per nest. And by the mid 60s, just a few dozen nests and virtually no live chicks, an almost unbelievable population crash in just 20 years. What was puzzling was that it was hard to see how people could be affecting the osprey on isolated Gardner's Island. No one was shooting the osprey. No one was destroying their nests or harvesting chicks, eggs, and, and our eggs. But Poulston soon made the case that the culprit was dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, commonly known as DDT. Very soon after the insecticidal properties of DDT were discovered in the late 1930s, it was in use around the world to kill mosquitoes that carried malaria. It was also sprayed as a powder directly on people to kill lice, chiggers, and fleas in an effort to reduce typhus. It showed very little toxic effect on people or other mammals. In fact, it was considered a miracle of modern science, and there's no question that it saved a lot of lives. In fact, the Swiss chemist Paul Hermann Müller was awarded a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1948 for his discovery of DDT's insecticidal properties. However, by the time Dennis Poulston was witnessing a drastic reduction in osprey in the 50s and 60s, DDT's reputation had already been tarnished. Wildlife managers, managers had noted that though it didn't immediately kill mammals, it certainly killed fish and amphibians, and it killed most insects, not just mosquitoes. It also killed spiders, crustaceans, just about anything with more than four legs. And one of DDT's supposed benefits, its persistence in the environment, proved to have a very dark side. Because DDT breaks down slowly, whether in the environment or inside an insect that has absorbed it, 
it had a tendency to concentrate in predators that ate insects. And because fish, fish absorbed DDT in the water and also ate insects contaminated with DDT, predators that ate fish, like bald eagles and osprey, were especially vulnerable, even out on isolated Gardner's Island. And it turns out that in many birds, high levels of DDT disrupt eggshell formulation. What Poulston noted was that osprey eggshells were so soft that broke when parents sat on them. In 1962, when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring as a warning of the dangers of indiscriminate use of pesticides, DDT was the arch villain. Silent Spring is often credited as being the start of the environmental movement in the United States. The book was on the bestseller list for more than half a year. But it's important to note that although there was public outcry and hearings were held in state capitals and in Washington, and commissions eventually released recommendations, not much actually happened. Almost everyone outside the chemical industry was in agreement by that time that indiscriminate use of DDT was bad, and yet no laws were passed to limit its use. That's why Dennis Polston, high school biology teacher Art Cooley, who Eric mentioned earlier, and university chemist Charlie Worcester gathered like-minded people to create the Brookhaven Town Natural Resources Committee. This event brings to mind Margaret Mead's famous quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. The Brookhaven Town Natural Resources Committee began writing letters to the editor about the hazards of DDT. And when one of those letters was read by a Patchogue husband and wife team of activist lawyers, Victor and Carol Yannacone, Margaret Mead's small group of thoughtful, committed citizens found the partner they needed. Charlie Worcester remembers Victor Yannacone saying, sue the bastards. So that's what they did. With reams of scientific evidence and a team of experts assembled by the Brookhaven Town Natural Resources Committee, Victor and Carol Yannacone filed suit against the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission to stop them from spraying DDT on wetlands across the county. The Yannacones first won an injunction in, this, in the summer of 1966 that ordered Suffolk County to immediately halt the spraying of DDT. But that was a temporary solution. And the idea that a group of citizens could sue a government agency or anyone else to claim environmental damage that didn't necessarily affect their own property was something no one had successfully done before. When a judge pressed as to what the plaintiffs wanted, Mr. Yannacone posed what he said was a constitutional question whether or not damage to natural resources has any bearing on the individuals who live in an area where the resources may be damaged. This is a question that has never squarely been decided by any court. Whether or not there is a right for an individual to have an environment that contains wildlife and trees. Now, to us, this concept seems obvious. But before this case, it had never been decided in favor of a group of citizens. During the trial, Dennis Poulston gave expert testimony on osprey and food webs, accompanied by his gorgeous watercolor paintings of food webs in different Long Island habitats. You could hardly come up with a better illustration of our Unitarian Universalist seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. Poulston's food webs highlighted seventh principle interdependence beautifully. Using his art, he explained, how DDT became more and more concentrated as one animal ate the next in the food web. By the end of the testimony, the judge had been convinced to extend the temporary extension into 1967. A few months later, spurred by the publicity around the trial and the injunction, the Suffolk County Board of Supervisors passed a ban on DDT. And it's a good thing they did because although the judge agreed about the danger of DDT, he eventually decided he didn't have the power to tell Suffolk County what to do, and he lifted the injunction at the end of 1967. But by then, the momentum against DDT was gathering steam. Dennis Polston, Art Cooley, and Charlie Worcester, and other members of the Brookhaven Town Natural Resources Committee formed the Environmental Defense Fund to extend their success. Under pressure from this new group, the state of New York declared a ban on DDT in 1971, the very first state to do so. And in June of 1972, after Long Island's newly formed Environmental Defense Fund sued the newly created Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA banned the use of DDT nationwide. By that time, over a billion pounds of DDT had been spread over North America. 
and we were very close to losing Osprey in the Eastern United States. Thankfully, in the years after that, as levels of DDT in the environment slowly diminished, Osprey and bald eagles and hundreds of other bird species, as well as countless species of creatures with more than four legs, began to recover. This year, as we mark the 50th anniversary of the EPA's DDT ban, Osprey are thriving. And in a few weeks, they'll be back on Long Island, nesting on tops of trees, cell phone towers, and roadside platforms. I love to see them and hear them soaring over my own backyard in Patchog on the South Shore. And all of that started because Dennis Polston spent a good part of his life outdoors. His lifelong connection to nature led him to a love of the wildlife of his environment and a willingness to advocate for it. If Polston and his friends hadn't noticed the problem and acted, it's entirely possible that by the time the county or the state or the federal government ever got around to doing anything about DDT, it would have been too late. So what can we as Unitarian Universalists do to defend our right to a natural environment? First, we should recognize that we all need to do what we can in our own homes and yards to reduce the use of chemicals. During the DDT trial, one of Suffolk County's defenses was that the DDT they sprayed only amounted to about 5% of the DDT used in Suffolk County. The rest was applied by farmers and homeowners. Second, it's important to admit that some of these chemicals have valid uses. No one wants to let children die of mosquito-carried diseases like malaria. But as a society, we need to monitor, investigate, and spend the capital necessary to ensure that we're always looking for the least damaging ways to solve human problems, ways that don't destroy nature. For example, Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge on the South Shore did a study to investigate whether they could reduce mosquitoes breeding in the refuge's marshes. They found that undoing most of the channels dug to drain the marshes decades ago, restored natural tidal flushing, leading to higher fish populations that ate mosquito larvae and reduced mosquito hatchings, all without pesticides of any kind. In fact, the restored marshes have significantly more wildlife than unrestored marshes. And one more thing we can do is get outside, develop the kind of connection and love of nature that Dennis Polston had, be an advocate for the natural world, Lawyer Victor Yannacone argued that you have a constitutional right to a natural world with Osprey, and ever since courts have agreed. So take advantage of that right. And that brings me to SEED, the Center for Environment, Environmental Education and Discovery. SEED's mission is to connect people to nature. We believe this makes people healthier and happier. We also believe that, as it did for Dennis Polston, connection to nature primes people, young and old, to be advocates for the natural world. SEED is all about connections. We connect people and nature, and we serve as a hub to connect other nature organizations in our region to each other. We also have a vision that art and nature go together. If anyone personifies the syn synergy between art and nature, it's Dennis Polston. His beautiful and scientifically accurate food web diagrams showing how DDT concentrates in the environment had a major impact on the judge in that very first trial. We also feel connected to Dennis Polston and the history of environmental leadership on Long Island because we are stewards of 50 acres of county land in Brookhaven Hamlet that is called the Dennis Polston Nature Preserve. All of us who live on Long Island can take pride in that EPA decision 50 years ago that rescued osprey and bald eagles and so many other animals. It all started here. At SEED, we recently began a new program we call Wave Makers designed to help young people experience the natural world and learn how to become advocates for it. We know the spirit of Dennis Polston is alive in our young people. My personal commitment to SEED comes from my own love of nature and from a belief in that seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism, the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Working to further SEED is a way to honor that principle and I encourage anyone who is interested in supporting SEED or becoming a volunteer to get in touch with me or Sally or Eric. I also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so you can see what we're up to. The link will be in the chat. We're also always offering new programs for adults and children, and I hope something we are doing will be of interest to help connect you or the children in your life to nature. I've invited Sally to say just a little about SEED's programs for young people, including our new Wave Makers program.
Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to share a snapshot of what we do at SEED. As a science and elementary educator for most of my adult life, I understand the importance and power of education in helping to create a community of thinkers and doers. Our mission statement is SEED is a not-for-profit nature center that inspires connection to the joys of nature through education and experience, which restores our balance for a healthier community. We know that immersing children in nature helps them to develop a true understanding of the natural world around them. Not only do we see it from our own eyes, but there is also much research out there to validate this statement. One of our goals is to be able to offer programming for any child that would like to participate. This means growing our scholarship fund. All of us at SEED are truly thankful for your generosity at Unitarian Universalist Fellowship at Stony Brook for funding the tuition for a child to attend our summer nature experience in 2021. Last year, we were able to send six children to our summer program. We are hoping to double that this year. Last year, we held our first spring farm and nature experience. And one of the most memorable moments was when the children pretended to be Osprey. And as they played, we shared some important facts about Osprey, what they eat, where they live, how they care for their young. The children spent the rest of the week wanting to build their own child-sized bird nests on the grounds of seed. Our philosophy for learning is play-based or action-based and through doing, children construct their own knowledge. Of course, we occasionally steer them a bit here and there. During our summer months, we are in the forest, by the creek, at the bay and on the farm. This month, we begin a whole new program called Wave Makers. As adults, we see so much around us that we should do to create a healthier planet. And we know the children see this too. We are polluting our water, destroying our soil, and creating way more trash than we need. Not to be destructive, but because there are so many of us and we often opt for a quick and convenient um, and convenience, which is not always the best method. We have seen what this Gen Z population can accomplish. And we know we are in good hands if we empower them with the tools and knowledge they need. Wavemakers is a new way to educate the children on setting their goals, driving their instruction, and modifying or readjusting when they need. Of course, we keep them on the road and support when needed. We started this program for 10 to 16 year old children and our first focus is on water. The children have explored snow, water in the woods, followed animal tracks in the snow, explored the properties of sap for maple syrup, tested snow and water and mud and decided they wanted to learn more about water in the woods, which the plants and trees use for nourishment. They also went with Ranger Eric on a seal walk and helped inform the large group of participants about the seals on our shores in the winter. We are hoping that this type of education grows with other local organizations because it is amazing to see the learning when the children are in the driver's seat. This method is too important of a way to learn to keep for ourselves. We have already had an organization from out on the North Fork ask if they can visit and learn more about this program. Hopefully soon, we can begin a similar program for younger children, possibly called Trailblazers. I hope what we do inspires, and I would like to leave you with one of my favorite quotes by Baba Diom. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we are taught. Thank you.
Now please join in singing hymn number 1064, Blue Boat Home, offered by Tom Pelletier and Ron Posnack. Standing on these mountains and plains Far away from the rolling ocean Still my dry land heart can say I've been sailing all my life now Never harbor nor port have I known The wide universe is the ocean I travel and the earth is my blue boat home. Sun my sail and moon my rudder as I ply the starry sea leaning over the edge in wonder casting questions into the deep drifting here with my ship's companions all we kindred pilgrim souls making our way by the lights of the heavens in our beautiful And greet the infinite sea before me. Sing the sky my sailor's song. I was born upon the fathoms. Never harbor nor port have I known. The wide universe is the ocean I travel. And the earth is my blue. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue. Closing words today are from Dennis Polston. As a resident of the hamlet of Brookhaven since the end of World War II, I have seen many changes on Long Island, but much is unchanged and a growing number of dedicated, selfless people are striving to save what remains so that not only we, but also our children, grandchildren, and generations yet unborn can continue to enjoy the, nat the natural treasures of Long Island. As I extinguish our chalice and bring this service to a close, I share these words by Maureen Killerin. We extinguish this chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth.
When I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s, I don't remember ever seeing a bird of prey. And I was a nature kid, so I was looking. But they were all in great peril by then. I'm incredibly grateful to Dennis Polston and that small group of thoughtful, committed citizens that I don't have to live in a world without osprey. I encourage you to follow their example. Whatever your passion is, go forth today and do something that makes a future generation grateful. Whenever my head starts to hurt Before it goes from bad to feeling worse I turn off my phone, I get down low I put my hands in the dirt I try to stop the world from moving so fast Try to get a grip on where I'm at To simplify this dizzy life And get my feet in the grass As I'm going back to the earth I'm going back to the earth I'm going back to work I'm going back to the earth the only explanation for a high rise must be that everybody wants to get high and move on up to a deluxe apartment in the sky. But the higher we go, the taller we grow. We lose sight of the land below where well, you can have your place up in outer space. Cause my home is where my food is grown. And I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back to the earth I'm going back to work I'm going back to the earth I'm going back I'm going back to the earth I'm going back to work I'm going back to the earth Now we are animals And we are wild well, we started with some motion at the bottom of the ocean. Now we're swinging from the tops of the trees. We are animals and we are wild. And to truly be forgiven, we must all get back to living with the land in harmony. I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back to work. I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back. I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back to work. I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back. I'm going back. I'm going back.